When the whistle blew, I punched my time card and drove home bleary-eyed after a long shift unloading cargo at the docks. But there was no greeting at the door, no dinner waiting on the counter. My daughter, Chelsea, usually home by four, was nowhere to be found. No note left behind, car keys still dangling on the hook. I called her cell phone, got no answer. I was miffed, but not overly worried. She was 18, street smart, capable of taking care of herself. I watched Jimmy Fallon and went to bed. When she still hadn't come home by morning, I called the police. I called her boss, her friends, canvassed the neighborhood. No one had seen her except Tommy the bespectacled five-year-old asthmatic who lived with his stripper mother in the duplex next door. He'd seen Chelsea the night she went missing, in front of the house, looking nervous, before climbing into a green Corvette. You sure that's what you saw? I demanded. The boy nodded. A green Corvette. The police figured it was some secret boyfriend of hers. Someone I wouldn't approve of. Maybe they'd run off together. It was a week before they found her. Stripped naked, wrapped in plastic, bruised wrists, missing teeth. Dumped in the ravine by the railroad. Dead. I looked up every green Corvette in the city. There were surprisingly few. An old woman on Clarence who inherited a green Corvette from her decades dead husband. A young hothead uptown who wrecked his green Corvette in a street race two months ago. And then there was Gerard. I remembered when he moved into the neighborhood, how he knocked on our door and introduced himself as per his court instructions. The police told me they'd investigated him. He'd been squeaky clean since his last arrest, and he was with his parole officer the night Chelsea was abducted. Bullshit. I took my frustration out at the gym, on punching bags, for hours. I'd fume to the other Steve doors about him. Friends in low places offered to take care of him for me. I said no. Then, one night, I found myself parking outside his house. I watched him through the windows, eating cold pizza in his Y fronts, the TV flickering dirty movies. I found myself surreptitiously turning the back doorknob, pulling on rubber gloves. When I got home, Tommy the neighbor boy was smashing Tonka trucks in the driveway. What's on your shoes? He asked as I stalked past. I swallowed hard, but kept my cool as I wiped the evidence on the grass. Don't worry about it. You didn't get it off, he called after me as I mounted the front steps. Your shoes are still all green. That stopped me. Green? I stepped under the streetlight, inches from Tommy's face. Yeah, there's green stuff all over them, he repeated. But my shoes were, in fact, splattered in a vibrant and sickening shade of burgundy red.